Hello and welcome to XP Solutions XP Live webinar. My name is Gavin Fields and I'm a senior water resources here at XP Solutions. Today's webinar is titled Best Practice for Detention Basin Design. This webinar will be useful for you whether you're new to designing detention basins and structures or whether you're refreshing your skills. And hello, that's me. Uh, just a bit about uh, XP Solutions for those who are unfamiliar with the, uh, the company or new to uh, uh, our products. Uh, XP Solutions provides software for modelling uh, wastewater, stormwater and flood solutions. Uh, and we're particularly proud of our graphical user interface and analytical engines. And these uh, address um, the ability, give you, users the ability to include CAD and GIS data and from a stormwater perspective, solve the full St. Bennett equations for gradually varied one-dimensional unsteady flows. And additionally, XP2D has a 2D engine uh, that uh, addresses particularly floodplain solutions. So today, uh, the topic, again, best practice for detention basin design. Uh, I'll cover a few uh, aspects. I'll provide a bit of an introduction to uh, detention basin design go through a little bit of theory, won't be too technical uh, about it, describe some of the application of detention basins uh, and attenuation systems. At the end I'll go through a live demonstration inside our software showing how we can quickly build some simple models and from that simple demonstration hopefully you'll be able to uh, apply that uh, in your own workflows. Uh, introduction, so why do we need or why do we design detention devices? Uh, and obviously uh, uh, humans have this great propensity to develop areas to provide habitable uh, living spaces and uh, these two pictures here just show a simple site that is uh, in the process of being converted from what is otherwise rural or uh, uh, natural landscape into uh, what will actually be a relatively high density development on the right hand side there. You can sort of already see some of the uh, buildings that have been constructed on the bottom right hand corner there. And it's this functional change in uh, landscape that results in changes in stormwater discharges during rainfall events. And uh, the observation of these changes it triggers demands for detention requirements. And so I've just got a couple of uh, simple photos during a rainfall event. This is actually taken from, uh, from my office. Uh, where I'm located in Brisbane, Australia. And uh, this is uh, during a rainfall event looking down on a, on a street and an area that is in the middle of being uh, developed. And at this point in the rainfall event, there, you might be able to make out there's a bit of uh, water on the road, and in particular on the uh, right hand side of that road, there's a vehicle that is starting to be surrounded by water. So, so far, this system is performing relatively well. However, not long afterwards, we then get to see situations like this, where the road is fully uh, inundated, the vehicle on the left hand side on this instance has floated um, away and is no longer situated where it was. And whilst that's the bad, my last photo I went downstairs and that's the ugly. And that depth of water in this particular system is uh, about 1.5 or 1.8 metres deep in what is actually a, a major road environment uh, in the uh, Brisbane region. So detention systems could be implemented to uh, mitigate this kind of storm event, which unfortunately for this location is actually a regular event. This type of uh, rainfall and depth of runoff has actually occurred about four or five times over the last 18 months. Uh, so a bit of history. Um, again, so the impact of development has been observed by you know, engineers, scientists, planners throughout history. It is in response to these observations that engineers and scientists have uh, challenged themselves to try and identify solutions that protect our uh, society, populations, buildings, uh, and of course infrastructure. Uh, in response to, uh, to that, uh, a number of guidelines uh, have been prepared to uh, try and help establish a framework to uh, facilitate this um, protection of these populations and, and infrastructure. And more recently, and, and I say recently in the, the, uh, the human scale, uh, the last sort of 50 to 100 years, we're getting documentation that is requiring or dictating that we need to reduce peak discharges from our catchments, particularly those in response to development. This engendered the, uh, the field of hydrology and that assessment of discharges from catchments and again detention basins are often seen to be the, 
the cure or the, the ultimate solution to mitigating our development activities. But of course we needed to uh, derive some equations over time for them to subsequently be proven. Now, this is a bit of theory. Uh, detention functionally relies on the principle that flows can be delayed by the addition of storage uh, into a, uh, a catchment or a system or a site uh, or a new loss be added to the system. And when I describe loss there, I am, I'm talking about some kind of infiltration loss or extraction of water from the catchment. And those losses could come in the form of collection systems in rainwater tanks for uh, potable or non-potable demands or somehow delaying through the capture to uh, infiltrate it back into the ground after the rainfall event occurs. Uh, the calculations uh, obviously must conserve uh, mass and energy and are generally based on the continuity equation and subsequently Bernoulli's equation as well. And uh, Bernoulli's principle is functionally derived directly from Newton's second law uh, and uh, this essentially describes that if a volume of fluid is uh, flowing from a region of potentially high pressure to a region of low pressure, and there is um, inherently a gain in force on that, uh, that volume of fluid, which therefore accelerates it downstream. Now what that means to us when we design detention basins is that when we include storage, if the system increases its depth of flow and therefore head, we apply more energy to the downstream side of that detention basin. And from a pure discharge perspective, this can be a counterintuitive process or make it more difficult to uh, uh, achieve the desired outcomes. So we need to ensure that we watch the depth of flow in these situations. Uh, for an orifice uh, controlled outlet, this is uh, one of the key equations and uh, the parameters in this particular uh, equation uh, relate to obviously uh, areas, the cross section of the, uh, the detention structure, H is the depth at any given time, uh, CD is the uh, coefficient of discharge for the given orifice and T is time. In this particular equation there are unfortunately more than one unknown parameters and that makes it very difficult to assess by hand. Uh, so the moral of the story here is I'll probably try not to do this by hand and look to uh, an iterative software based solution such as some of the products prepared by uh, XP Solutions. Uh, open detention basins or above ground detention basins, I'll talk about those more in a moment, but um, that can be subject to infiltration, particularly either during the event or pursuant to the storm event. Uh, calculations are generally driven by depth uh, based on Darcy's law or some of the other standard infiltration equations. But of course this infiltration is then driven by the underlying material. And in these uh, couple of simple uh, images, I just show the difference between a clay material, a silty material and a sandy material over time. And this is in minutes. Uh, showing that over a 15 minute period we get a lot more infiltration of course through the coarser materials. So if you're in the uh, west of Australia uh, where it's uh, generally seen to be a sandier uh, region then of course uh, infiltration is a very popular method of mitigating stormwater uh, peak discharges in conjunction with storage devices. Just as an application uh, or an example uh, at this point I've just uh, taken a simple industrial site uh, this particular site uh, covers an area of about 2.83 hectares. It was developed only a couple of years ago and has an effective uh, fraction impervious or, or change in that uh, surface characteristic of about 80%. Uh, the general calculations that were undertaken for this, I'm sort of jumping to some, uh, some results first, but just to set the frame for the rest of this presentation, the uh, existing development discharges from this catchment were in the order of about 0.3 of a cubic metre per second. When the site was subsequently developed, that uh, increased up to about 0.5 of a cubic metre per second. So that's a relatively substantial gain in discharge uh, as a direct result of changing that fraction impervious. As a solution to this, the, uh, the site did introduce a, a, uh, an above ground uh, storage solution and that storage solution with its controls was able to reduce that discharge to very similar values with a, a simple orifice control on it to uh, try and return the discharges back to the pre-developed case. But of course clearly we can see that there is still a separation between the green line and the blue line in response to the uh, volumetric change. So for the downstream environment it still had to deal with a greater volume of discharge which is a whole other issue away from 
pure detention basin design. So what are the types of, uh, of detention basins? And, and I'm happy to broadly categorise them into these two simple solutions, or two simple groups. One are the, uh, the open solutions, uh, parks, sports fields, golf courses are fantastic uh, and uh, regularly used areas for detention, ponds and lakes and, uh, and other areas. Uh, these uh, open solutions are generally, I say generally cost effective to build, uh, but generally always take up larger volumes or areas of land and that comes at a cost. Uh, closed solutions are uh, rainwater tanks which can be above ground and located on uh, residential or commercial or industrial structures or underground storages in unleaded car parks or roadways are uh, very common these days. Uh, consequently, because they are a structure themselves made out of some specific material, be that plastic or concrete, um, they are expensive to build but when we seek to increase density uh, and maximise yield for our clients, increase profitability and at the same time produce a high quality living areas, sometimes these solutions are very popular. And a couple of examples of uh, some closed solutions are uh, such as this storm chamber which is an arch based solution and this particular one is a relatively complicated arrangement where it takes advantage of not only the, uh, the physical voids inside the arches but also the granular area that surrounds that particular a storage device. Another simple one of course is just a, an underground tank and underground tanks could come in the form of circular pipes like this large diameter uh, system but could be um, cast in situ block work tanks. And there are a number of uh, proprietary products out on the market that uh, are available to uh, our industry to um, meet your needs. And from these storage volumes we then need to uh, understand the impact of the outlet control. And these controls are, are critical in controlling discharge to ensure that when we have these uh, depth issues uh, relative to Bernoulli's principle that we're able to maintain our discharges appropriately. Standard controls are pipes, weirs, orifices and orifice plates and valves and uh, hopefully everyone can pick that this uh, particular orifice plate doesn't quite meet the, uh, the challenge it was intended to because the orifice plate itself is actually larger than the, uh, the downstream pipe. So this particular orifice plate shown on the uh, third image should actually be about a third the diameter of the pipe that it was actually there for. So that was a bit of a mistake in construction. I find that one rather amusing for myself, but um, one interesting to see. Other types of controls can be uh, overflow weirs and inlet uh, structures combined like this one here with a protective grate to ensure that there's a high degree of public safety. Uh, you can have uh, overflow field pits with notched elements and these change the characteristics of that overflow to improve your uh, flow controls. And finally the, uh, the good old simple one which is the uh, head wall and pipe arrangement. So of course what makes a good detention basin? I've already generally sort of described them but uh, trying to maintain a low head can sometimes be critical to uh, ensuring that your detention basin can be deemed to be a good detention basin. And by having a low head uh, we uh, minimise gradient issues we reduce the depths that we need to potentially excavate for open-end underground solutions or otherwise we may require a pumped solution. Now what this, uh, these two graphs here show is um, the difference between having a constant volume but changing the head. And so what I've done, I, I prepared a very simple model that the bottom graph is a storage device that has a surface area of 100 square metres and starts off with a uh, depth of flow of one metre. And so the maximum discharge was one metre of head uh, and it was actually through a, uh, a 300 millimetre diameter pipe. Uh, generates a peak discharge of about 233 litres per second. If I were to reconfigure that same storage volume instead of having effectively 100 cubic metres of storage, if I converted that to a 50 square metre device with two metres of head, then uh, my peak discharge shifts and ramps up to 353 litres per second. And so that I've got the same storage volume but the, uh, the physical characteristics of how it is set up on my site can rapidly change the characteristics of a simple 300 diameter pipe. So I suppose the moral of the story there is uh, shallow and flat are the, uh, one of the key characteristics for a uh, useful basin subject to your site constraints. Otherwise you can have clever controls and a hydraulic break is an example of a very clever control 
and, uh, and that's a device that changes the characteristic of a standard orifice outlet and uh, we can see here on the graph on the right hand side that the, uh, the graph can ramp up, uh, do a bit of a wobble and then return to a typical orifice uh, outflow and that blue uh, volume that's uh, shaded there effectively is the direct reduction in storage that may be required on your detention basin. So these are a very clever proprietary device and, uh, and are generally available uh, across the globe. Uh, then we get into uh, optimization to uh, ensure that our basin is as efficient as we feel that it possibly can be. We can optimize detention basins with respect to their, their uh, the depths, their surface areas, and then of course their discharges. And so these are a couple of screenshots from our software. Uh, and the optimization panel on the right hand side there allows us to manipulate the, uh, the diameter of downstream infrastructure based on uh, pure depths, uh, resize the surface area of the basin if the uh, outlets are controlled or in the combination that I've, I have selected at the moment which is where I can resize the downstream pipe based on a uh, predefined peak discharge and also manipulate the, uh, the area of the basin on a known depth. Uh, a very, very uh, useful set of optimization functions that really do address most of the uh, site constraints that anyone may face and of course also tick off your uh, guideline requirements wherever your modelling is being undertaken. Uh, when we model uh, a detention basin we typically need some uh, standard uh, data requirements and these include uh, node data for storage, surface areas, geometries and of course understanding those inflows. Link data requirements will come in the form of the decision on whether you have an orifice outlet, a pipe outlet, those weirs or those other clever controls that might be uh, associated with a link. From that link data we will then be able to understand discharges and flows relative to the losses, roughnesses or other head losses that may be associated with the, uh, the element. And these uh, parameters are all required so that we can uh, feed the dynamic wave equations enough information to fully assess the uh, system rigorously. The last piece of information is understanding the, uh, the boundary conditions downstream of the basin. Uh, is the basin subject to a free outfall in an open channel or uh, another open environment? Is it discharging into a waterway, a lake? Do you have tidal controls or other user definable characteristics? Having the flexibility to have these uh, variant tailwater conditions can really uh, impact and make your tension basin design far more reliable if you can repeat or uh, represent the real world as best you can for your given site in your assessment. Uh, so I'm just going to jump over and uh, just go through a, a quick example uh, in our software on how you might go about undertaking a very simple modelling process to size of detention basin. I, I'm going to uh, run this as a sample in our product called XP Swim, uh, and which is very similar uh, for the users who have access to uh, XP Storm. Uh, and some of these processes are also available in our uh, other pro product which is uh, relatively popular here in Australia called XP Rafts. And uh, just today I'm going to start from a brand new model and just show you how simple it is to uh, actually run through and size a detention basin very rapidly with uh, relatively little information. Uh, so I'm creating a, a new model uh, and I'm going to uh, call this uh, uh, industrial. I'll use that same site that I showed in that aerial photo earlier in the webinar. And uh, when we get into the software, the first question the software asks is what units are you in? And so if you're in the uh, United States, obviously you'd use uh, imperial units, but the area of the Australian and Asian region, uh, definitely metric would be where you would sit. And here is our, uh, our software. To start off, I'm actually going to bring in a, a background image, uh, which I have uh, already uh, have available to myself. That's that same image that uh, I showed before, and there is my uh, my site. And just to demonstrate the uh, surface area, I have a rule tool on the right hand side, and I'm just going to roughly click the uh, the boundaries just to revet my surface area. And the total area is about 2.83 hectares. Uh, now that I have uh, this. Um, aerial photo in play, I'm going to go over to my uh, runoff layer where hydrology is undertaken, the RNF button at the top. So I'm going to uh, introduce a node and I'm going to change this node to existing. 
to uh, just describe what I'm doing. Uh, just to make it even easier to see uh, these nodes, I'll just turn off that background image even though it's uh, still there in the, in the background. Uh, for this model I need uh, two fundamental background pieces of information. One of those is rainfall. The second is uh, some infiltration details for this site. So I'm going to uh, import in a, uh, a template file and uh, these templates uh, for Australia are uh, being made available on our website and I'm just selecting a region called Logan Central which is just to the south of uh, where I am here in Brisbane in Australia. And the software has just uh, imported in the Australian rainfall runoff temporal patterns uh, and the associated depths of rainfall for that region. Uh, I'm going to go into this, uh, this node and fill out some of these characteristics and the, uh, the catchment area was 2.83 hectares. We're going to assume that the site went from a, uh, a purely undeveloped or 0% impervious catchment at uh, prior to its development stage with a uh, catchment slope of 0.01 which is uh, 1%. I'm going to uh, go and select uh, my hydrology first and this is a rapid process for most of us into uh, Lawrence's method which is a preferred method here in Australia and I'm going to run with the default values including the n of negative 0.285. I'm then going to select my rainfall and just for today's example I'm going to run a 100 year 60 minute storm. I'm then going to go in and uh, create some infiltration. I'm going to create three infiltration options. Uh, I run relatively simple ones with uh, an initial loss and continuing loss uh, method and I'm going to say that my initial loss is uh, 0 and my continuing loss is 2.5 with an N value or a Manning's value of 0 0.045. I'm going to add that and uh, just to make life easier I'm going to assume that in a developed case the uh, site roughness becomes a bit smoother for the pervious areas and then when we introduce the uh, developed case, there will be no continuing loss for the hard stand or roof areas. So these are my three loss methods that I'm implementing for this particular model. I'm going to uh, edit these uh, quickly. Uh, so to start with, uh, I'm editing the uh, pervious uh, continuing loss of 2.45 with a Manning's roughness of 0.045. Sort of a rough grass and setting a uniform loss of 2.5 millimetres. I'm just going to uh, repeat that process for the next dialog box and change this uh, to 0.035. And finally for the uh, impervious component which we'll use and apply in a moment, I'm going to set that to 0 and 0, so no, no losses uh, and uh, in this particular example the uh, pervious value won't matter but I'll still change it to uh, 0.035. And for this uh, particular catchment I'm going to select this uh, pre-developed infiltration option. That is functionally all I need from uh, an input perspective for this uh, simple catchment uh, but I do need to set some uh, run control parameters. Most importantly, how long am I going to run this model for? And so I've selected a 60 minute storm and so I'm going to run this for two hours. Hit OK, I'll just hit save and hit solve and all things being equal, the uh, run dialog came over to my other screen, it's already finished and uh, I can review the results from this catchment. And I have a pre-developed peak discharge rate of about 828 litres per second for this given storm event. Now I could run a series of storms which to try and identify the critical storm duration and that is certainly something that I would recommend but just for today's demonstration I'm just going to highlight on this one storm. Now I can then copy this node and I'm going to call this developed. And when I go into this, I'm now going to change the catchment characteristics and assume that the uh, catchment goes from being 0% impervious to 80% impervious. So my pervious area is going to reduce to 0.566, not just a dot there. And my impervious component will ramp up 
to 2.264. And we do this split for Lawrenson's method specifically. And uh, hopefully some of you may be familiar with that. Uh, if you have any queries about Lawrenson's method, by all means be in touch with us uh, after this webinar on the hydrology side of things. I'm just going to repeat that uh, selection process for the rainfall and infiltration. And I'm going for uh, that particular option in this instance. And I also need to change the infiltration option because I'm in the developed case and we're mowing the lawn. I'm going to hit save there and I'll run the model again. I can select both of these items and review those graphs at the same time. And now we can see that our discharge rate has uh, increased substantially. So we have an extra cubic metre per second virtually as a result of that change in um, physical characteristics. So we need to try and get back to this 828. I'm going to uh, do a final copy again and add a third node and I'm going to call this mitigated. Uh, so mitigated it will have the same characteristics as developed, but I'm going to do uh, a little bit more to it from the uh, in the hydraulic layer to demonstrate how we can uh, deal with increased discharges. So I'm going to add mitigated just to my hydraulic layer and put in a downstream pipe. Uh, to start with, I need to uh, give the hydraulic layer just a, a few pieces of information, and they relate to some simple levels. And I'm going to assume that for today that this uh, site is at about uh, RL10 uh, and uh, is an above ground solution. And I'm just going to nominate a spill crest at 12. And I'm going to tell the software that from this catchment area, where we have this now 1.8 cubic metres per second, I'm going to introduce some storage to the system. But I want the software to help me out to work that out because I'm not sure how much storage I need. Uh, I'm going to run a, a constant area method, just for simplicity today. Uh, and you might guess a simple value of 50 square metres couldn't have one. It uh, doesn't, doesn't particularly matter what value we apply here. And I'm going to turn on my optimization. I'm going to uh, set the software to resize for the downstream pipe systems um, to tell me how big a pipe I need, but also how, uh, how big my basin needs to be, based on a maximum depth of one metre. And that could be because of a site constraint or a guideline requirement. Uh, we know that from the pre-developed case that we have a peak discharge of uh, 828 litres per second. So that's the control on this link one. I don't want to exceed this value. I'm going to go to my downstream node and in fact I'll call this uh, outlet. And I'm going to make this an outfall with free outfall provisions uh, using the minimum of the uh, critical and normal depths. Again, from hydraulics perspective, uh, by all means, um, get in touch with us if you have any queries on any of those aspects as well. Uh, I'm not sure quite about the, uh, the levels, so I'm going to uh, duck out of this particular dialog box and then go into this link and go to its conduit profile to see its uh, geometry. By default, the software puts in a 50 millimetre diameter um, pipe. And uh, for this combination with our optimization utility, we need to actually put in a, a larger than expected diameter pipe. And so I'm going to think, suggest uh, right now that the uh, pipe system might be a 600 diameter. If you're really not sure, you could even increase that to 1.8 metres or, or 2 metres, a very large number. Uh, and the so software will then optimise downwards with this pipe diameter. I'm going to copy uh, the 10 across and uh, nominate a slope of 0.05% uh, and solve for my downstream invert and I'll apply this to my downstream node and maintain a, uh, a top node elevation of, uh, of RL12. That's not particularly important, particularly important for this uh, particular equation. I'm going to hit OK there. Uh, hit OK uh, again and hit save. I'm now going to uh, 
change the tell the software we need to run the hydraulics at the same time and also tell the hydraulic layer uh, how long we need to run. So under job control hydraulics and uh, tell the software to run the hydrology calculations and the hydraulic calculations at the same time uh, and I'm just going to run this for one hour in this instance and hit final save and solve. And what the software is now doing, if I bring the uh, solve engine across, it's now iterating through and trying to det determine a suitable combination uh, of pipe size and surface area for this basin. And every time the, uh, the number changes, it's actually resetting and making a change to the, uh, to the model. This shouldn't take uh, too long. Of course, the closer you are to what will be the re most realistic answer, the shorter that would take. Uh, and I can uh, select on this uh, link one, knowing that my target peak discharge was 828 uh, litres per second, or 0.828 of a cubic metre per second. And the software has optimised me to a solution that gets to 778 cubic meter, uh, litres per second, um, which is a bit underneath our target, but certainly in the right realm. And if I were to select on mitigated, my other control that I had suggested was one metre deep, and uh, it has actually taken uh, 983 millimetres. So this combination so far is uh, certainly ticking my boxes. It's, uh, it's meeting the objectives. To see a thorough uh, review of the changes, I can actually go to our output file from the software, uh, go to my industrial site output file, and let's just come over to my other screen. If I go down to, uh, I can just do a simple search, and I'm going to look for, uh, oh yeah, detention is probably what I should have searched for. Detention, and uh, it's found it for me. So under table E23 in our output file, it is suggested to me that uh, through th 31 calculations, uh, it has determined that uh, an appropriate diameter for this system is uh, 0.5 of a metre, which is a bit less than that 0.6 of a metre that I had nominated up front, but I need a surface area of about uh, 0.124 of a hectare. And so that's uh, 31 iterations with a reduction, increase my, uh, my, my basin, and uh, that information should also feed back into our dialog boxes to confirm that we've updated our interface as well. So that's a, uh, a simple optimization, just using these uh, um, very, very useful tools that we have in our software, uh, and they can be configured for your own requirements uh, and then used in conjunction with other elements such as weirs or orifices which would be uh, located on, on multi-links. Uh, but hopefully that gives you a, a quick review that within the space of you know, just under over 10 minutes, I've uh, taken a simple total site, assessed its hydrology quickly here, and then determined uh, a simple detention solution with uh, relatively little information, uh, but is the foundation for a good design. Uh, again, I'd uh, just like to thank everyone for sitting in on today's presentation. Uh, I, hope, uh, I hope you did get something out of it, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you soon.